He talked about the anxiety people have of public speaking, and I'm looking at my iWatch, and my heartbeat is going up, up, and up, and up. I think I should have floated earlier this morning. But um, it's, it's surreal to be here today, because three years ago, 2015, I was here thinking, wow, I want to start a float center. And to be up here talking about it is really um, just, just amazing. So I wanted to thank uh, Ashcon and Graham for inviting me. My talk is completely different than Justin's, and it's all about the business side of the house, and just so that I understand, who in here has already started their float center? Okay, and who is starting a float center? Okay, great, so it, it very balanced in the room. Um, it definitely is an art and science, right? And when I talk about science, I'm not talking about just in science. I mean, he's, he's definitely one-upped me here. Um, following him is, is tough when you start talking about science, but I'm talking about the math behind uh, running a business. So just to kind of level set, for those of you that aren't familiar with Float 60, we are based in downtown Chicago. Our first center was Float 60 River North. Uh, we've been open about two and a half years. We have five tanks, uh, we have a meditation room, and we also do VR. We opened February 2016, so that was about nine months from the first time I ever floated. And that's how profound floating was on my life. Very fast. Uh, the second location, we just opened about four months ago, and that's Float 60 Northwest Indiana. And for those of you that don't know Chicago geography, it's very close to Chicago, um, even though we are treated like foreign citizens from Chicago people. It's about 45 minutes south of my first location. Four tanks there, uh, cryotherapy, retail, uh, and like I said, we just opened in March. The last one here also definitely jumps my heart rate up. I've been working on this one for two years, and that's the one that's about to open in five weeks or so, and that's Float 60 South Loop, which is also in downtown Chicago. Six tanks, uh, meditation, VR studio, infrared sauna, cryo, and retail. So that gives you kind of a little bit of an understanding about how we, we go to market. Um, we've got a little bit of a combination of, of different modalities. So <laughs> my team is, is very significant in my operation, and I know a lot of us here run our own float centers and, and actually do every single job that needs to be done in the float center, which is amazing and very admirable. But um, my approach from the beginning, because I did have a different profession up until about four months ago, um, I have this amazing team. And right in the middle here is my family. In fact, my husband and my son are here. Where are you anyway? Oh, good, they are here actually. And then... Um, my, my son is actually working for Float 60. He, is, he just finished the internship program. And then I have the beautiful woman on the right there, Lisa Martin. Lisa, right here, down here. She is the glue that holds Float 60 together. Would not be able to do what we do without her. So from the beginning, I took the approach that um, I needed to have key people in place from the, from the start so that I could continue to do things and continue to be very strategic in the business. And then you can see all of our, our other uh, folks. We have about uh, nine people at the Indiana location. We have about uh, 10 or 11 people um, at the Chicago location. And the idea is to kind of pull those people over all three locations uh, eventually. And then if you see the, the dog in the middle, that is Lola. She is a free resource for marketing. She's a great resource for marketing. She comes to all of our events. So as you can see, the point is, these people are artists and science, scientists in the sense that you have to have an art about you to work in a float center. You're dealing with very uh, volatile situations, very sensitive people, so you really have to understand how to adapt your personalities to accommodate these different guests. Um, from a science perspective, water, calculations, tank chemistry, we are chemists. We are actually doing things 
very strategically, very methodically to make sure everything's sanitized and, and perfect for every guest that comes in. So, um, very big part of the business. So, what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through the business plan. These were our kind of startup projections. And for those of you that have not invested in uh, the Float Tank Solution business plan, and, and again, they do not pay me, I say this all the time, but they really provide great resources. My business plan and my startup costs were um, definitely put together through resources and some other things related to the business plan from Float Tank Solutions. So, first location, I have a hybrid of different tanks. I do nothing easy. I have all different manufacturers that I work with. We have three wave rooms, a float pod and a samadhi tank. And the reason why I picked a samadhi tank, it is my personal favorite. And people in Chicago um, have, that have ever floated, or if anybody has visited Chicago and has gone to space-time tanks, that's what they're used to floating in. So from a budget perspective, I allocated about 25 k per, per unit, a little bit less for the samadhi. For the build-outs, um, I said, OK, based on everything I learned from my apprentice program, I'm going to budget about 50 k per room, and that should cover other things, including the lobby and whatnot. So those numbers are never right. So whoever's in this stage right now, add 20%, like no joke, okay? Because everything will go wrong, it's, it's true. But if you, if you kind of look at this overall, I added some contingency, uh, working capital is very important, especially if you're going to a bank for a loan, do, do not short change and you know, just skim yourself so tight that you can't operate. Um, so five tank float center in Chicago, I said 450K. Okay, that should give you a good guideline. Now, the most important part is the revenue projections. So when you're building your float center, you have to have a plan, and I know everybody in here does. We're all very, very smart people that, um, you know, expect that this is a business and not just a hobby. And if it is a hobby, that's great. But if it is going to be treated like a business, there are some, you know, strict guidelines that I would say I followed um, in my methodology. So I looked at capacity. How many tanks do I have? How many floats can I do a day, a week, a month? Okay, so capacity is the maximum we can do with that floating modality. So that was about 980 a month or 35 floats a day. From a revenue perspective, we charge about six, we, we look to get about $60 per float. That, that makes us comfortable in terms of our business plan. So the maximum we could make with floating alone based on that capacity was about $2,100 a day, uh, 14000 a week, or about 58000 a month. So then the reality comes in. Okay, that's your capacity. The occupancy is, you know, whatever you think you can do to fill those tanks and to what level. So I picked the number 66%. I felt that... That would be a good start. You know, we have a big pool of people in Chicago, so I anticipated about 23 floats a day and about 160 in a week, 647, you get, you get the idea. So in terms of revenue, that comes out to be about $38,000 a month, 39. And then I also have retail. I factored in about a buck or two per person for retail, knowing that most people won't buy anything, but if they do, you might spend, you know, 30 or 40 bucks a ticket selling various things from salt, uh, on it products, whatever, whatever you choose. So overall, with that 450K investment, the overall capital or the overall revenue that you could anticipate is about a half a million dollars. Uh, added in some uh, gift cards too. Okay, so this is where the, re the big reality check is for me. And again, this is our plan, okay? None of this is our actuals. This is what I went with in terms of just studying business, knowing business over the years. There's three major things, especially if you're not gonna run the float center yourself, your labor, your rent, and your marketing. I don't know about you, but do any of these numbers scare you a little bit, or do they look right to you? I mean, or did they seem high? Does it, anybody startled by those numbers? Hi. What's that? Make more for labor. Make more for labor. Okay, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely the three dynamics that, for, for us, are the biggest investment. And I, I find just in consulting and working with folks that, you know, maybe the marketing is something you add on later, but let's just take a look at it. 
a healthy business, service business, over you know, multiple industries, they say about 30% should be allocated towards labor. Rent, Chicago's a different dynamic. I envy those of you that are not in big cities. You can get so much real estate, it's so awesome. But we have a you know, pretty high, so about 12% of that 500K or you know, 60 grand a year. And for marketing, this, this number, and I'm a marketer, so I, I definitely lean on spending money towards marketing, but when you're a startup, they say that you should spend anywhere between 10 and 12% of your top line revenue towards marketing. I, I don't know many people who do this. Um, I uh, basically do a lot of the marketing myself, so I save a little bit here, but I've compensated in, in other areas that we'll talk about. So when you look at that, and you look at that monthly number, that should give you some kind of perspective um, as to what normal businesses that sustain over time would actually pan out to be. So going back to that marketing number, what I wanted to do today is kind of break things down. There's definitely an art and science to kind of knowing how to spend those dollars as, as you think about your monthly spend. And so I broke it down into five categories, advertising and promotions, ex experience, the actual experience inside your float center. So that's an investment, that's a marketing expense too. Um, social relationships, partnerships and community, and then my, um, something that's near and dear to my heart, coming from data and analytics is data and management. So just to break these down, and by the way, thank you, Justin, for mentioning the Cubs. We love the Cubs. That, that was our ad in the, um, I think it was the day they announced uh, David Ross's retirement. We had an ad there, you could see it. Very proud of my cups. So advertising and promotions, definitely an art and science. Art being you have to have good content, right? Uh, public relations and comprehensive branding, something we really invested in that I kind of lump into that category. Then we've got the experience and content. So definitely more art here. Your guests, this picture here that I'm showing, your guests actually provide great content in terms of art and you know, sharing experiences, whether it's through storytelling, testimonials, I, I definitely lump that into the art category. The other thing that we invest in is something we call service recovery. So when we have a situation inside our studio where something isn't quite perfect, or we feel that the float could have been a little bit better, whether it was really our fault or theirs, we'll go ahead and comp somebody's flows. So there's, there's an art to kind of understanding when and how to, to do that, to make sure the customer leaves wanting to come back and certainly refer other people. Then you've got social and relationships. I find just working with different uh, businesses that a lot of people ta would take this $5,000, right, that we're talking about a month and lump it right into this category. So many people are spending significant dollars on Facebook ads, which is very effective, wildly successful, um, but there are other things that you, know, you, you want to kind of spread your dollars across. So social media, of course, all channels I'm talking about here. Influencer marketing is something that we're recently um, investing in that's more of a, a manual process. We're not looking at tools or technologies for that yet, but there, there are definitely some out there. And then we invest very heavily into the referral programs. So we have a, a different referral program for our members than we do regular customers. And we really feel that, most of you know this, once a customer tries your experience and they love it, they share, right? So putting a system and a process behind making that automated is very, very powerful. Um, some of the tools that we use, we use Helm, there's a, a very easy way to actually do this within the software you use already. So um, very important in terms of social and relationships. That's, that's probably where most of the budget goes when I look at it across the board. This, this fourth category, I talked about this yesterday in the uh, marketing forum when we were talking about the, the membership drives. We invest a significant amount of resources in partnerships and community building. So we actually have brand ambassadors that are part of that labor number, that 30%. You know, this is including this position, these people that go out in the community and go from door to door. I mean, we're talking feet on the street, people going business to business and building relationships. And we kind of formalize that with offering our members uh, offers to their businesses, and we have reciprocity there. 
So we, we invest in that through resources in, in people. It's a big part of our, our labor. And then finally, I said this was near and dear to my heart, um, data and management, the science behind managing your database. So for those of you that haven't started your float center yet, are you already collecting emails somehow through like a landing page or something like that? Can I see a show of hands? That's not enough, people. Definitely need to do this. Um, the, the sooner you can get ahead of collecting customer data, the better off you're going to be. Um, over the last two and a half years, we've been super aggressive to this. I drive Lisa crazy with this. Every event we go to, we really try to collect emails. In fact, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a chance to give me, have you give me your email too. I'm sure you're excited about that. We're going to have a little giveaway. But what we want to do with that is nurture your existing customer base. So much of our activities that I see are around customer acquisition and not necessarily reinvesting your efforts into your existing customer base. We kind of think, okay, they've been here, they love us, they'll come back. But there's a huge opportunity to kind of drive that one incremental visit by doing more effort around retaining the existing customers you have. So when I say database, that could be an Excel spreadsheet, it could be you know, Float Helm, MindBody, whatever you're using, some are much better than others. You want to have complete control over that data. Um, there's a lot of third-party companies out there. Be very careful about letting other people control your email, your database. That is your intellectual property that you definitely want to keep control over right from the beginning. CRM relates to customer relationship management, so that can be done in terms of a tool. This is where the technology comes in. We really don't need to invest in really robust CRM systems here. We, we really can keep it pretty simple. I mean, even using MailChimp or Constant Contact, yes, that's an email tool, but it's a CRM tool. So you want to have something that's allowing you to manage the different customers you have and allow you to target them differently. So that's what I refer to there. And that's really what the last piece is, segmentation and personalization. We have an intake form that we use. It's, it's kind of like a, the waiver intake form. We ask a bunch of questions, like what do you want to get out of floating, sleep improvement, anxiety reduction, you know, just the laundry list of things we ask. We don't do a good job of then segmenting our content around those questions. These people have shared all this information with us, and I believe most of them are hoping that somebody's looking at it at some point, but we don't. So I'm, I'm looking at myself going, you know, I've been working in marketing for 20-some years, working in data, and I don't even do this. So I'm embarrassed by that, right? So this is kind of a 2.0 float 60 effort. Lisa, you're taking notes on this, right? This is, this is our next thing, right? We really want to focus on segmenting this database. If you have 20,000 people in your database, there should be different buckets that they fall in. And then you can personalize, not, not to the person, but to at least their interest of why they're there to float. And then this content that we have, like this, this information from Justin, I'm sitting over here in the back, just in addition to watching my heart rate go up, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is so powerful in terms of content, right? If, if we could kind of segment our database by people who do have anxiety and share one or two of these a month, it's just, it's just so, it's such a powerful thing that's so much more than doing a social media ad, right? So that's, that's going to be a big focus for us. So the last point on this slide is um, customer acquisition versus customer retention. And I've talked about this on a couple podcasts, um, so forgive me if you've already heard me say this, but we have two different uh, types of float centers at Float60. We have an urban footprint right in the city, the, the two locations in the city, and then we have a suburban, right? The, the Indiana location is much more of a bedroom community is what they refer to it as. And the way we're having a market is much different. So in the city of Chicago, or New York City, or wherever your center is in a big city, you have such a pool of new blood coming to your float center all the time, right? So focusing on customers' acquisition often and regularly makes total sense. You, you should do it anyway, but what I'm saying is focusing more on customer acquisition makes sense. 
In a suburban location, focusing on customer retention, I think, is tenfold even more important. It doesn't mean the other one goes away, right? We never want to not do customer acquisition. But nurturing the people have, that have already come in becomes much more important because you only have so many people to pull from. So these retention strategies, the segmentation and personalization, I believe, becomes much more impactful and critical to sustain your business over time. You know, unfortunately, the reality of you know, growing businesses is there's going to be a lot of growth at one time, and then over time, people will kind of drop off just because they might not be religiously staying disciplined in these, these different things, or they might be burned out if they're doing everything themselves. So this, to me, is a, is a key thing. If you think about your float center right now, are you in a fixed geographical area where there's only so many people to, to pull from? Or are you in a place where you're constantly going to get fresh blood like Chicago? And you have to kind of modify your strategies accordingly. So um, I'm not sure how much time. I think I'm close. But as far as acquisition and retention, I just wanted to touch on this one more time. Um, from a membership perspective, the retention part, I believe, is membership, right? Because you're, you're trying to get a customer to convert and commit to you, to be loyal. And so our membership strategy has been very significant to us over the last couple of years. We are um, now laser focused on building value for our members that goes beyond a discounted float price. We try to do things like um, upgrade to 90 minutes in, you know, in Chicago. I know this is a big debate in the industry, but we are float 60 because people float for 60 minutes in Chicago normally. We'd love for them to float for 90, but people are resistant. Um, so 90-minute floats for members are free, right? There's, so it's a value add for our memberships. We give a free birthday float. That's pretty uh, normal. We also have prioritized scheduling. So coming from the hotel industry, we had so many hotel rooms and we had to block some rooms for VIPs and I take the same approach with managing the capacity in my float center. We'll block off a couple floats here and there because we do fill up on the weekends. So we call them VIP blocks. That way a member can always call and usually find a space. And then usually the day of we'll, we'll release them so that we can uh, you know, make sure we'll, we're full all the time. Um, we also do favored nation pricing for, for members, meaning that the member will always get the best deal, better than any package or promotion. So that's included in it. But the, the real significant thing here, and it goes back to the partnerships and community, art and science, is those brand ambassadors I talked about. This map here represents kind of a cross-section of the partnerships we've developed in Chicago. This is a very labor-intensive exercise. It looks easy that we, you know, we built this map, but each one of these little uh, plots is one of our partners that we've actually built a relationship with. We have our brand ambassador has set up a program where we give their, their members benefits at Float60, or maybe they give us benefits. So it's, it's a really great um, reciprocal, beneficial, it's like it's a three-way mutually beneficial relationship. So I, I really encourage people to do this because I think it, it's goodwill for the community and it's just, it's great all, all around. Um, so this is something that we're really going to be focusing on more and more. Okay. I promised in the bio or the, the talk overview that I would talk about my favorite tools. So I am like a, I don't know how many apps I have on my phone. I know I have 83,000 emails. But I, I have more apps, I, I guarantee, than anybody in this room. And it's a sickness, really, it is. I have that shiny toy addiction. So I'm always trying different apps. That's just my, in my blood. Again, I drive Lisa crazy because she's not a technologist and I'm always imposing this on her. So you have to be careful. Um, but these are the favorite tools. For those of you that are just starting, I, I know there's a couple of my consulting clients in here where I've, I've stressed to you, get QuickBooks or whatever... Uh, accounting system you want to get, get it now. I don't care if you're just starting like five minutes ago, get it now. Because you need to put this conference in your QuickBooks, you need to put the travel in your QuickBooks, and they make it so easy, it's right on your phone, you can integrate it to your bank account, and you can do your accounting right from your mobile phone. By the way, most of my businesses run right from my iPhone, and um, 
that's why these tools are really important. So Sprout Social is a, kind of a listening social media app where you can, in one place, pay a subscription to monitor all of your channels to see if people are mentioning you so you're not hunting and pecking like I've been doing the last three years. This is a very good tool to you know, really just optimize your, your work. Uh, MailChimp, I think we all know what that is. Google Drive, duh, right? I mean, if we're not using Dropbox or Google Drive to share documents with our accountants or partners, I mean, it, it's just like a no-brainer. Um, Google Analytics, so much power in analyzing the website traffic that you have. And I could talk another hour about website, but we're not going to do that today. Um, definitely just use the tools. You don't have to be a data scientist these days. They make it pretty easy to have you like, get a handle on your numbers really comfortably. Um, I'm going to mention Grasshopper on the side. I was talking to somebody at the bar last night, and my phone was ringing. It was an overflow call that went to the studios that then comes to my phone. So anywhere I am, I'm able to answer the phone from any three of my locations because of this Grasshopper app. And there's other ones out there, but this is the one we use. It basically rings at the physical location that you have and then overflows to whoever's on call, which is you know, usually me. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm mentioning this because this is how you develop your community relationships. Go out, reach out to the businesses, find out who's managing what, find the right resources, and make connections with those people. It's very, very powerful for us. And then Slack. Who uses Slack in here? Yay! See, I told you. Um, so Slack, and, and again, I love Floatelm, but the Floatelm with multiple locations, there's just a couple limitations that I'm sure Ian and the Magic Wizards will eventually add to their, to their uh, functionality, but Slack is great for when you have multiple locations or you're working with partners to have communications kind of in an organized way. So it gives you different channels, if you will, that are topics. You can have a marketing channel, you can have a manufacturer channel, and, and it's just a great way for us to kind of keep track of things. Most importantly, my vision for using Slack is to make all of our employees feel, because there's 29 of them now, I want them to feel like they're part of one team. And Slack really enables us to do that. So I'm happy to uh, go in. I'd love to show you my phone upstairs. You really will freak out when you see how many I have. Um, there's, there's a lot of great tools out there that I'm happy to talk about. And with that, OK, this is the last one. I told you, everywhere we go, we collect people's information. I promise in here, you're not going to get an email. We're literally giving away a gift card. And I'm doing this just so that you understand how we do it with our customers, all right? So I have a $100 gift card, and I'm going to give it away upstairs. And I just want you to go to this website. It's our way of building traffic. Float60.com slash promo. Just fill out that little form. And imagine you're a, you're a prospect for your float center, OK? Put, put your mind around this being your float center. You're at an event, or you're out at a bar, or you're at a restaurant, and somebody asks you about what you do. You just click on this home page from your phone, and hand them your phone. They'll put their information in. Now you have captured their information from wherever you are. It does not have to be fancy. It's like four fields. On the back end, I'm collecting emails left and right. So when we go out and do these wellness fairs or these um, you know, different community events, I'm now monitoring in the back end, OK, we collected 50 emails here. We co collected 60. We collected zero. Um, so this is, this is how we build our, our business. And you know, proudly, we're at like 24,000 people in our database over two years. So that's, to me, a very exciting metric. So go ahead, get your phone out. I know, it sounds crazy, right? All of you, get your phone out. No, only if you want to. While you're doing that in the background, I want to show you, does anybody, have you seen this slide before, this logo slide? You're supposed to not see it. The point of this slide is, this is called a MarTech slide. This is a 2018 MarTech marketing technology slide representing marketing companies that are hot right now. Not all of them. These are just the ones that are recognized by this company. They're, they're categorized by advertising and promotion. 
content and experience, social memberships, e-commerce and sales, uh, data, and then management. Anybody who tells you they're a marketing expert, they're full of it. Nobody can be a marketing expert in today's world. So the point of this is you're going to need help understanding what's out there. Keep it simple. Don't try to do it all yourself. Hire people who are subject matter experts in each of these categories versus just generalists because there's a, there's a lot out there. So yeah, if you uh, went ahead and signed up, we will be answering questions upstairs. And I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much.